thank you if you're willing to stay for a few minutes just to give a supportive audience to your classmates. Hey guys, so I'm sure that we are all aware of the online app and trading brokerage Robinhood. Robinhood was extremely, extremely popular throughout the pandemic, and it still is, primarily with young investors. In the early months of the pandemic, Robinhood saw over 3 million new users join their platform, with a good portion of these new users being college students and teenagers. Now, the average college student and teenager lacks the basic financial knowledge and investment experience that some of us may have, or an older individual may have. They all flocked to Robinhood because they thought stock trading was an easy way to make money quickly. However, this is not the case, and they found that out the hard way. It's consistently found that the market will beat out the average investor when it comes to annual returns. But why is this? Is this because they lack the basic financial knowledge or the investment experience? Well, it turns out there's a lot of psychological factors involved, so today, I'd like to talk about behavioral finance. I'm gonna to touch on what behavioral finance is and how it differs from traditional finance. I'd also like to talk about the two main categories of biases within behavioral finance, which are cognitive biases and emotional biases. And lastly, I would like to talk about a theory known as the endowment effect. <coughs> so, what is behavioral finance? Well, behavioral finance is a field that blends behavioral and cognitive psychology with basic economic theory. Now, to understand how that differs from traditional finance, you have to understand some underlying assumptions within traditional finance theory. The main underlying assumption is that humans are rational, and that when they're faced with a decision, they will go at that decision to optimize at 100%. And it actually states that humans will calculate probabilities. I don't know about you, but I never go as far as to bring out a calculator when I have to make a decision and calculate the probabilities. Another underlying assumption of traditional finance theory is the idea of the efficient market hypothesis, that the stock's price or securities price reflects all available information about that company at a given time. And as information changes, the price will change accordingly. And in theory, this would mean that it's impossible to beat the market. You couldn't trade above or below a, a stock's true value. But behavioral finance actually goes against this, and it almost says the exact opposite says that humans are irrational to the core, that they're not 100% rational. Rather than fully optimizing during the decision-making process, they go with what's efficient and what's satisfactory. Now, this is seen in a lot of examples throughout our lives. Say you were going to a store to buy something, say a lamp. You go to the store closest to your house, you look at their lamp selection, and you see a lamp that's 5% off. You pick up that lamp, buy it, carry on with your day. Later in the week, you find yourself across town at a different store, buying something else. But well, you happen to go buy their lamps, and you see that same lamp that you just bought for 15% off. This is the idea of humans not fully optimizing. To fully optimize in that scenario, you would have to look up on Google all the lamps available and find the cheapest one. But like I said, humans care about efficiency and what satisfies them. Robinhood investors also saw this, where they bought into a stock that was they considered to be discounted, but two weeks later they saw it was much, much lower and they could have bought in at a lower price. They didn't fully optimize. So these mental shortcuts and heuristics are things that humans use on a day-to-day -day basis, but the problem is they lead to biases. So first off, I wanna talk about cognitive bias. And a cognitive bias has to do with how we recall and process information. A cognitive bias that a lot of us know of is confirmation bias. Confirmation bias explains why someone is determined that the Detroit Pistons are the best basketball team of all time, or that McDonald's is the greatest restaurant in the world. Essentially, confirmation bias is a result of interpretation, and when you interpret something and then process that, you look for information that will back it up. And from the top down, all the information that you process from there on out is being shoved into that interpretation, that existing belief. The Robin Hood traders saw this as well. They don't know much about stocks, they're teenagers. They bought into a stock because they read a stock report. There could be one stock report that says this is a great investment. And there could be 10 stock reports that says this is a terrible investment. But because of their confirmation bias, they only cared about the one that confirmed their existing belief. Now, I wanna talk about emotional bias. Emotional bias has to do with how we feel rather than how we think. 
Daniel Kahneman is a psychologist, former professor at Princeton, endowed researcher at University of Michigan, Harvard University, Cambridge, and he most notably won the Nobel Prize in Economics for his research on prospect theory and loss aversion. So the latter idea, loss aversion, that's what I want to talk about when it comes to emotional bias. What is loss aversion? Well, it's the idea that the pain that you experience for a loss of X is greater than the pleasure you experience for a gain of X. So an example with the Robinhood investors, a lot of them were trading stock options and they have no idea what an option even is. Some of them got really lucky and they made $1,000. When they made $1,000, they were filled with joy, filled with pleasure. But in that same week, plenty of them lost $1,000. And that pain of losing $1,000 outweighed any of the pleasure they had from gaining a thousand dollars. So this idea of loss aversion plays into a lot of our lives in various aspects. And it also plays into what's known as the endowment effect. The endowment effect is the idea that when you have a possession, whether it's a material or an idealistic possession, you tend to overvalue it. Professor Kahneman found this in a research study as well. He brought two groups and he assigned one group to be the buyers, one group to be the sellers. He went to the sellers and he gifted them a coffee mug. He went to the buyers and he gifted them nothing. The sellers that had the coffee mug in their possession, he went to them and he said, what do you value this coffee mug at? And they said, $8. He goes to the buyers and he says, what do you value this coffee mug at? Keep in mind, they don't have it in their possession. They valued it at $3. So this is the idea that when you have possession of something, whether it's material possession or idealistic, you tend to overvalue it. This was also seen with the Robin Hood investors as well. They bought into a stock not fully understanding uh, its true value, and they thought, okay, this will go up because to them, this is inherently buying a piece of a company. They felt a sense of ownership. But it turns out these stock investments weren't good and they weren't going to go up. And so they overvalued it compared to its true value and its true market price. So when it comes to behavioral finance, it's important to understand that we as humans are irrational. We can't be 100% rational. We have biases, but understanding the underlying aspects of behavioral finance will help us to mitigate these biases. And as students in finance and students looking to pursue a career in investment banking, it's important to understand these and understand that we all have them. So I urge you to understand and learn more about behavioral finance as you pursue your career. Thank you. Okay.